I'm just going to test it. I'm going to go to all right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in the room, Startups Mike, and everyone tuning in online. My name is Nina, and I am the community manager here at Incubate, the Sydney University Startup Accelerator. It is my absolute delight to be uh, live streaming to you wherever you are today. Um, and I would like to introduce shortly our star of this afternoon, Mike Nichols. But before then, Mike is very generous, Ooh. generously sharing his airtime with some of the startups from the Incubate Class 16 Accelerator cohort, who I would like to introduce you, you to today. So firstly, uh, first up, a change study. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Nadia, and this is my pitch. Australia's international student market is worth $30 billion annually. Each international student has to navigate multiple complex procedures, such as course selection, enrollment, health cover, and visa application. I am Nadia, a former international student and current migration agent from a change study. We are the solution. A change study platform is the marketplace for all international students. We consolidate four applications in one place, which reduces the search time by 16 hours and helps students to avoid unregistered authorities. With closed borders, we are focusing on online short-term courses and programs, which will be credited towards the higher education. At the change study, we invested in students' educational success. All right, um, so here's the problem with news anchors. News anchors are unfortunately human. Um, so human news anchors are incapable of providing everyone in this room with their own preferred news in their own language whenever you guys want it. But now imagine this, if you had a news anchor like Carl Stefanovic on call 24-7, what he was able to what if you was trained in 16 different languages and was able to tell you the news you wanted to hear? And what if he never slept? So I'm Mikhail Edwin from Newsplay. And so Newsplay is this news streaming service that uses this technology where an artificially intelligent animatronic newscaster will deliver you news um, in a hyper-personalized way in 16 different languages. Um, thank you. Hey there, I'm John, former founder. Refunded is here to, buy, to provide instant refunds on e-commerce purchases. I'll give you an example. You make a purchase for your favorite t-shirt from your favorite store. It arrives, it's the wrong color, the wrong fit. You want to make a return. Currently, you would have to wait 7 to 14 days for the money to enter your account. At Refunded, we pay you the money in your account instantly. It's that easy. Thank you. Hello. Um, school holidays are a hassle between searching Google, online forms, trying to organize with your friends. Uh, we know that the school holidays are a pain for busy parents. My name is David. I'm the co-founder of Kid Campus, and it is our goal to change this. Since launching in September, we are now Australia's biggest online marketplace where you can book over a thousand kids' activities in Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, and Sydney. With Kid Campus, you can search programs based on your location and your kid's age, interests, and everything else that suits their needs. Once you're a member, you can book with two clicks and easily share your itinerary with your friends. The passionate people running these programs also love Kid Campus as we provide them with the tools that they need to manage bookings, staff, rostering, invoices, and everything else that it takes to run these camps for the kids. At Kid Campus, school holidays are sorted. Hi, I'm Ed from Codex Research. The methods that we currently use for medical research are really little more than tweaks of methods that we've been using for hundreds, even thousands of years. 
And we've learned a lot by using these methods. But as we search for cures for complex diseases like cancer, dementia, and viral diseases, we realize that all we've accomplished up to now is really just pick the low hanging fruit. 92% of drug trials that succeed in mice fail in human trials. And this just reflects how poorly we truly understand human biology. We need a new disruptive technology to help us take medical research to a whole other level. At Codex Research, we're developing such a technology and early lab results are validating that we are on the right track. Some incredibly exciting breakthroughs, even things that we weren't expecting to see at this stage. If you're interested in living in a world that's free of cancer and dementia and viral pandemics, you should come have a chat with us. Hi, I'm Patrick, and I'm a co-founder at Ballot Box. Ballot Box is a democratic engagement platform for every context. We have launched a smartphone app that you can use to discover and raise issues that you care about. Ballot Box has a solution for every level of democracy, from local councils to federal elections, from professional associations to shareholder AGMs. Using the app, you can poke your community leaders for their stance on any issue. Then you can give them structured anonymous feedback. Our unique feature is that you can compare candidates side by side so you can make a better choice. Last year, we tried the app in two elections, in the in this Queensland state election, in the seat of Maiwar, and in the federal by-election in the seat of Rune. We had eight politicians on the platform supplying their content, and we had 300 app downloads. From those users, we collected over 4,000 data points. Ballot Box makes money from selling premium platform subscriptions to the various entities in our ecosystem, and also from selling polls and data to market researchers. At Ballot Box, we're on a mission to help people engage in democracy wherever it happens. Thank you. Cows release methane, a greenhouse gas which contributes to climate change. Leather handbags account for 48.5% of global handbag revenue. What's the alternative? A synthetic handbag that's essentially plastic-based. I'm Serena, and at Kobe we have the solution. Introducing Kobe's premium cork handbags, made from a material that absorbs rather than releases CO2. Cork trees are stripped, not cut down, absorbing up to five times more carbon dioxide. There is no other brand in Australia providing cork handbags of this quality and level of design. Handmade in Portugal, cork is as durable as leather and three times lighter. Kobe is committed to planting a cork tree for every handbag purchased. They say money doesn't grow on trees, but it does when you're selling Kobe's premium cork handbags. <laughs> Have you ever been at work or school filled with fear that you've got blood trickling down your leg? If you haven't, you know someone who has. 86% of women have experienced this. I'm Dean from Pixie, and yes, I'm a guy standing here talking to you about pads and tampons. Why? Because this is a problem that has affected so many women, and we can do better. Our bathrooms are sexist. If we want a gender equal world, it has to start with basic hygiene supplies. Pixie supplies Australia's most eco friendly pads and tampons, completely plastic free, inside and out, including all the packaging. We also donate 50% of profits to educating girls around the world. Pixie brings pads and tampons to workplace, school, and public building bathrooms where they should be. Hi, my name is Duran, founder of Neurogy. We are de developing a medical device to help post-stroke patients to back to their normal life more quickly. We know after stroke, the patient will lose their mobility, and rehabilitation is a way to help them regain the lost ability, but it's a prolonged and tedious process. In rehab, the physios will try to uh, guide the patient to image, move their hand, and uh, 
manipulate their hand to match their thought. But this is hard. With Neurogen, we can connect the image movement from the brain directly to the muscle. So the brain can get a better feedback and relearn the lost ability much faster. That is us, Neurogen. I think most of us went out for lunch today, and I'm sure you noticed it's pretty disgusting out there. It's hot and it's very humid. Why is that? Well, it's very uncomfortable because there's actually water in the air. And in weather like this, a cubic meter, which is about this much, contains about 25 grams of water. The technology that we in Aqua are developing uh, allows you to extract that water from the air without moving parts and without requiring energy. Why is that important? Well, we all live in Australia. We know drought is a problem. Uh, last year we had a serious drought. It costs us collectively about $20 billion. And that doesn't even include um, a loss of wildlife, um, et cetera. So um, our technology is not only um, um, useful in Australia, but of course around the world where access to clean water is an increasing problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all of those intros. Well done, Class 16 of Incubate Accelerator Program. Uh, it's my absolute delight to pass the reins fully over to Mike Nichols for his Gold Standard Sales 101 workshop. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks so much, Mike. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the, the game, the people, should I say, the Aurora Nation, uh, one which we hold our meeting today. And all the people of all the nations and any of the people watching on the live stream and pay respect to their elders, past and present. Um, thank you. I've got to tell you, I'm so excited that you guys are all here, you guys are all here. And the reason I'm so excited is six months ago, this wasn't a guaranteed situation. Many of you all know, and I think we owe the name of Victor in gratitude because she did an enormous amount of work in the background to make sure that this happened. Frankly, this could have all been a shell. This could have all been gone. You might not have been here. We wouldn't have had this opportunity. So I just say thank you, thank you, Nina, and all the other incubate people who pitched in and helped out. We're very lucky to be here, and I'm so I'm wrapped. I'm thrilled that you have made it here, and hopefully from this we'll get some some really good startups happening out of this. So why are we here today? We're here today. Um, I'll give you a bit of history. James and I um, put this together. James Alexander, who's a former um, program manager or director of Incubate, put this presentation together over a period of the last four or five years in an attempt to try to help startups get through their first year of life and actually get some business and get their business started and really start to get some traction. Because you know, some of you will probably be able to build a product, but we need to be able to get that out. Now, I put the aircraft up there because I like the aircraft, but also um, it's a metaphor for your current situation. Your current situation is you have a limited amount of time and money in which you need to actually get your aircraft, your startup, off the ground, and we'll call that your runway. Sooner or later, you'll run out of runway. You'll either run out of time, you'll run out of money, somebody will run out of patience, and, and it's over. If you can't get the aircraft up, it's finished. So. We, we normally use that as a metaphor, I just add that we've also got the um, heat-seeking missile now, which is COVID-19, that doesn't help me much. Um, but as you'll see later on, maybe there's some bright spots to that, but um, let, let's talk through it. So today is sales day, and this is one of my favourite pictures for the year because this is where we get to actually hopefully get you all pumped up about this because it is something that not many people think about until it's even too late. Either they run out of money, or they get to the point where it's like, oh my God, I've got to do something now. I better actually get this out of the market. But the truth is, actually, every day is sales day, whether you know it or not. And if it's not, it should be. So I'll say that to you up front. Um, everybody wants this to happen by accident, right? Everybody wants to see a growth curve that looks like that. But it doesn't happen by accident. You can't just stumble into this. This happens deliberately. And you've got to make it happen. You're a founder. It's up to you. It's just not, we're not just going to come through the door. Very few people get 
such a fantastic crowd market tick on their first attempt that this just happened by accident. I can sit and watch this all day and I'm <laughs> I really like that. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about COVID-19, some new ideas, um, how things have changed, um, sales focus, why that's important for you, um, getting in sales tempo, which is very important. I encourage you to think about tempo in the way that you run your business day to day, week to week. Um, some sales definition and hygiene, metrics and sales management, how markets develop and how you can actually help develop your market, um, how you should go about picking your target market, because some of you might be quite general at the moment, but maybe you need to focus in, well not maybe, definitely you need to focus in on sub-segments of your greater market in order to start to get some business in the door. Um, and then building a lead machine. So, how do we get a machine that just drives leads through the front door, through the website, through e-commerce, through wherever, every single day, every single hour? How do you get it so that you've got, in fact, I was just looking at our, um, our uh, we've got a Slack counter that puts sign-ups on our for emails for our fund. And I'll tell you about the fund in one second. But we've, I'm sitting there watching it. It's literally been every five or ten minutes for the last two hours has been a new email coming through subscribing. Every time we send out a newsletter, we get people that want to do business with our companies or want to put money into our fund. It's sort of like a bit of a, so how do you get that to yourself? How do you get that every every hour, every day, every minute, if you're really lucky? How do you get that tempo happening? Um, 50 ways to generate leads. You will learn that during this whole thing. There's 50 different ways. So um, there's more than 50 different ways, but I've listed at least 50 different ways. It may actually be higher than that. Um, so, you know, I guess, why Mike? So who Mike is? Mike is partner at Main Sequence Ventures. Uh, Main Sequence Ventures is $240 million venture capital fund. I used to be the entrepreneur in residence here and spent a couple of years, actually not here, you guys were lovely out here. I spent two years down in the basement. Has everybody visited the basement? Yeah. The dungeon? Yeah. Okay. I spent two, two and a half years down there. Um, and so I originally, you know, a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, I launched my own business for $10,000 with a mate. We managed to get to 4.3 million in sales and that's 20 years ago um, in, um, yeah, in, in the first year of revenue on a 10K startup. It wasn't bad. Some people would call it over trading, but there you go. And then over the years, that business turned over more than 15 million over that time. Um, I was with Chandler Packer for four and a half years or so, um, roughly 45 million US each quota across a whole channel of people. Um, I've mentored dozens of startups to help them through their first year of life. I mean, how many startups have we had now? Now? Yeah. 125. 125, okay. So I can't claim all of those because I was a couple of years old, sort of a bit absent, but um, I've helped with a big chunk of those over the years. Um, I sort of help some of our portfolio companies with their sales and marketing activities or helping with ideas to get through problems. Um, so I just say to you, it's not business as usual. Okay, you're in a brand new business. You're launched in the craziest period in the last 12 months. It's like, what were you thinking? Uh, sorry, don't I understand. Um, so it, it's really, really quite a difficult time. But here's the truth, and I hate to tell it to you, but you probably sort of know this, but you may be in denial about that. Most startups do not survive. All the ones in this room, but most startups <laughs> don't survive. So the reality is, how do we, or should I say, how do we get you so that you make it through that first year? Because I'll tell you what happens. Here's what happens. We get to the end of the incubator, and I normally feel pretty good if we've got three or four solid startups that are on their way and are growing. But I'd love to see it being 100% of the startups. But the reality is, for me, over the years, it hasn't been. And the ones that have taken distribution and sales super seriously, those are the ones that have usually made it and got out the other side. So um, when you're an early stage startup, you've got two problems, and I call this an information asymmetry problem. You've got two different problems. So you've got a great product, but nobody knows about it, okay, so therefore you have no business, or you have a shit product, and you don't know that it's shit. So those are your two problems. Now, talking to a lot of customers up front helps solve both those problems. I mean, you might know that it's not good, okay, but maybe it's actually okay for a certain class of customer. 
But you've got to solve that problem. And the only way to solve that problem in the early days is to speak to lots of customers. Now, um, wait, there we go. So, post COVID-19, you've got even another problem now. You can't get on a plane, you can't go see people, you can't go to conferences. You might not even be able to work on your product sometimes. If you're a hardware manufacturer, some of those have been hit quite hard. You might not be able to raise funds. Good news is, I think actually, the raising funds might be getting a little bit easier, but um, so what I say is you can't change the wind, but you can change your sails. You can reef them, you can go up and down, you can go flat track. So you've got three sort of critical objectives over this next six months or so. Um, what I say to you, and I, and I said this, I wrote this slide originally a year ago, and I'm sort of number one, I'm starting to feel a lot more positive about. Um, so cash is like oxygen. Um, this was actually a little thing, so we did. Um, so love is like oxygen. Yeah, cash is like oxygen. Um, expect no funding for 12 months, but the market seems to have changed a little bit. Um, staying alive, your job is to build an early sales process that will help you generate and close leads. That's your job. On top of building a product. You might think it's all about product right now, but that's only half the story. I mean, Rocket Man is build a lead generation machine to help scale up your business. So, 2021, oh my dear. So, <laughs> I just say to you that um, 2020 was pretty crazy, right? Hands up. Pretty mental, right? Um, 2021 could be crazy, we don't know yet. Uh, what I'd say is there's a new thing called B1.1.1.7, um, and that's a 30% more transmissible and potentially quite, what would you say, um, makes it much sicker. So this isn't over yet, so don't expect that it's over, but the market is carrying on like it's early 2008, late 2007. Um, there's lots of cash around looking for investments. Um, six, nine months ago, this wasn't the case, but this last quarter or so, um, very definitely we're seeing people throwing money around, uh, at least in the public markets, we're seeing, it's like they've gone to the horse races. They're literally throwing money. You would have seen the, the big Wall Street bets and game, uh, game stop short squeeze in the last couple of weeks, something you've been laughing. Um, I wrote an article on that, you can go have a look, it's a bit of fun. Uh, so, People are, there's money around, okay, is what I'm saying. Now, um, in my mind, inflation might be on the horizon a little bit. Um, and why that's important is that inflation comes back, money supply tightens up a bit, people aren't maybe as liberal with their money as they might have been, um, and, and all of a sudden, maybe interest rates rise. And so what I, I suspect sometime in the next 12 months or so, we might see the market start to deflate a little bit and cash will dry up but maybe not for a year or so. So why am I saying that to you? Uh, normally I wouldn't say you go and raise if you can, but in this environment where there's a lot of money around, if you've got a solid story together, maybe you might want to think about that earlier than later, if you're thinking about, not this is investment advice, none of this is investment advice, but you might want to think about that earlier than later. Because um, if you've got cash, you've got runway. Spoke about runway? Mm -hmm. You've got cash, you've got runway. So, um, okay, so, um, this is, I guess, a couple of ideas about how we get you out in the world. Some of you may already be out in the world. Who's got over a thousand followers on any type of social media? Excellent. Fifteen on Instagram. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? Okay, we got to fix that. So. <laughs> What I say to you is celebrity and distribution is more important than ever. And nothing will tell you more about that than what's happened this week with Facebook and Google. Mm. Okay? Right now, we can't post on our Facebook page, can we? I'm, I'm hearing stories of businesses that are completely shut out of Facebook now, which yes. was their lifeblood, which was driving a large portion of their business. That's sort of important, right? So if you can't get into your prospect's inbox, their podcast, their news, or their Zoom, in my mind, you are dead. Okay, so how can you get in that feed? How can you get hold of the microphone? So what's the microphone, my last? Well, I talk about grabbing the microphone. What do we need to get hold of the microphone? So how do you get to be on the stage how do you get to be on the podcast or invited to the podcast? How do you get to be the person who gets the story written about them? 
how do you get to be the first call for the journal? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Or even better, how do you make your own microphone? So what can you do to actually get your story out into the world without having to rely on Facebook or Google? Um, now, this might come as a bit of a shock for you, but distribution or sales, um, I suspect, I think you probably need to spend maybe 50% of your time thinking about this. You need to spend 50% of your time working on your product, and then the other 50% working on recruiting a team. Yes, that was 150%. <laughs> <laughs> but distribution is important, okay? Your job is to work out how you can get the product into the world. Most people don't really think about this until their product, they think their product is ready or they're out of cash, but if they haven't sort of tested that on the world, um, their product's probably not ready. It's probably not necessarily what the customer wants. The customer probably going to make them make a whole lot of changes or just not interested. Um, so what I'd say to you is distribution optimally will be based into the product. And when I say based into the product, you'll build a distribution method into the product wherever possible. Now, some people that work for, some people that won't work for, um, but I encourage you to at least open your mind and think about whether there's a way that you can build distribution in the product. And we, we can talk about the easy one there, which was Facebook basically asking you to open up your address book. Anybody that's asked you to open up your address book and push it out, those are obvious examples of baking distribution into the, into, the, into the product. There's other ways you can do it, but have a think about what that looks like. And then the other one is how do I... How do I um, bake or make my build process part of my distribution? Now you see some people that they do call, it's called, they call it building in public. Uh, the best example I can think of this right now is uh, Dom at Fast. Have you heard of at Fast? Okay, um, Dom is an Aboriginal guy that's now living in the valley, he raised $20 million off Stripe about three or four months ago. Um, business is going like that. He basically builds in public. He talks in public all day, every day, about what they're building, what they're doing, what their customers are doing, what's happening with the product, how things are going. He's just on Twitter all day, every day, spreading it out there. But as a result, he's, he's got massive distribution. People are adopting his product. Um, and so what I'd say to you is, can you build in public? Can you actually share your journey? Can you? Talk about some of the challenges that you're solving as you do it. Demonstrate what's important. Highlight issues. Does that make sense? That's so interesting, yes. Sorry? That's so interesting. I, I saw one business, so the guy, he decided to open the factory, and he was posting some uh, posts on a daily basis, asking the questions, polls, all of that, about how shall I do that, and he got so many attraction and contacts and all of that, just discussing, so just discussing his journey on Facebook. Yep. Yeah, and so this is a really good strategy for getting a little bit of um, uh, uh, traction, if you like, with your market, and for you actually now to become the thought leader in the space or the expert. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Yeah. Is anybody sort of experimenting with any of that? No, okay. Mm -hmm. This will be a different answer next time. Right? Mm -hmm. I hope. <laughs> um, so I'll give you an example of um, something where when COVID first hit in early March, I think, or um, mid-April, um, there was 10,000, 12,000 physicists on their way uh, to Denver, I think it was, um, for the American Physics Society. Now, all the quantum computing people were on their way, and one of our um, portfolio companies, um, uh, Professor Mike Beaker from over at Sydney University, uh, the, the nano school, he was on his way and his team were on their way and literally they cancelled the whole conference when they all arrived in Denver. So everybody was hopping on the plane, everybody spent their you know, five, ten grand for a ticket or whatever it was, they all got there and they all cancelled it. And it's like, oh my God, what a disaster. But instead of calling, you know, just saying, oh, this is terrible, we're going to roll over and die, um, you know, what, what do we do? Well, Michael did was Michael got his devs to put together a website that could host all of the talks of each of the people who were giving a talk, as, as we're talking hundreds here, over the period of the, the whole week. And then we individually reached out to each of those people and said, we've missed out, it's been cancelled, but we've built a virtual version of it just here. And so he had his company name up on the site, powered by Q-Control, 
Um, and he managed to get something like 40,000 visitors to that site in the space for about two weeks. All of his target customers saw his name. He would never have seen before. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything that you know, cost him a couple of days worth of work and maybe a bit of bandwidth, but he spent no money on Google or Facebook. And he managed to get his name in front of all of those, more or less all of those people that were at the conference or planning to be at the conference. Now, why is that important? Well, when he wants to reach out to those people, they already know his name. It's not a cold deal anymore. They've seen what he's done. He's actually helped the community out. He, he actually volunteered it over to the community once it was built. And so there's a bit of reciprocity there where it's much easier for him to talk to other people that may not have known him before now. So this is a really good example where over the space on Sunday night, it was like, this is a disaster. Monday, Tuesday, oh my gosh, it's worked out so well. So, you know, literally turned it around in about 24, 36 hours, had it launched, and then had people uploading their, their conference um, video talks. They just did them on YouTube and pushed them up um, over that period of time. So I think that's a really good example where he's maybe done a microphone, you know, where he's basically created. I think mean, there's a couple of things he could have done that I probably would have done different, but he had some reasons for not doing it. But for example, he could have put a register button mm -hmm. so that he got all their emails and that you know he had an opt-in there to go and do his newsletter. That would have been maybe something like that. He had his reasons for not doing it, he didn't want to you know, upset anybody. But that, that could be something that you could do and all of a sudden you might have had an extra 10, 15,000 people on his newsletter. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's right. So um, I want to think about a concept I call, hello, did I break something? Did you break something? Uh, there you go. Okay, cool. Well done. Um, I'd like you to think about a concept I call asymmetric generosity. So how can you, at minimal cost or effort, give prospects something valuable for free with no expectation of return just to help them? Does that make sense? So how can you give them something easy and free and cheap? Well, it actually may not be cheap. It may cost you a bit to do but in the overall scheme of things, relatively inexpensive. How can you give the prospect something that they find valuable that will make them think about your business, make them think about your product, and look for some, what do you say, opportunity to, to engage your product? Obviously, it has to be related to your product. And one of the best examples I can think of, and I saw Austin Nichols, not related to me, but Austin Nichols from um, Meraki recently, or formerly from Meraki, who used to be a uh, uh, very dedicated mentor here, but he moved back to the US. Meraki was a wireless um, access point. We've got them up around the, um, we've got Cisco ones, but they were built by Cisco. So wireless access point, uh, you, you know, the devices, they've got aerials hanging off them, that's what we all connected. Um, back in the early days, what Meraki did was Meraki built a piece of software that loaded to your, your notebook and allowed you to walk around your office or your home and it would map the signal strength of the Wi-Fi all around your home. In order to get that piece of software, you just had to put your email address in and they would give it to you. You could download it, use it, put it in your notebook and it would tell you all the weak spots inside of your location. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, right? But what, are, what, what is that? What just happened there? You've got a lot of emails. They got your email address, they got your permission to market to them, but they also actually just found a Wi-Fi prospect because you wouldn't be downloading that piece of software unless you had a problem with Wi-Fi access. You're automatically somebody that they're going to want to market to pretty hard now, right? Mm -hmm. And now they know your email address, they're able to put that into Facebook or Google or any LinkedIn, any of the other ones that allow you to target by email address and follow you all around the web. So that piece of software didn't cost them a lot of money on the overall screen of things, but it allowed them to provide some value for free. You know, the, the user didn't have to pay for it. The user felt like they got benefit from the product and the company before they even did business with them. So how can you do that in your business? Does that make sense? Um, I'll give you an example of these guys. Last year, this I probably need to update some of the COVID examples, but MedTech, you might, Medtronic, should I say, you may be aware of a big MedTech company out of the US. They went out and they said to everybody, we are going to open source one of our respirator designs. 
back when everybody was super worried about us running out of respirators, say March, April last year. Um, and everybody was like, oh my God, this fan can't be, it's fantastic. Pretty soon after they downloaded the designs, and I downloaded the designs and had a look at them, and pretty hard to make and very old in the design. You would have looked at that after a week or two and you would have thought, eh, I can't make that. Well, actually, just launch it. And so, but already he's down, you know, allowed you to download a fully functioning design for a ventilator that anybody could build. Um, I don't think he would have had any trouble getting meetings, um, introductions, orders from anybody around the world after doing that. So that's an example of. Obviously, you're not in that position, but maybe there's something you've built that you can share that might be useful to people. Um, so a few sort of experiment ideas on what you could do. Tools or resources for free. There are always good guidebooks, concise guidebooks, non-self-promotional guidebooks around how to do a particular task or job. Um, micro virtual seminars on really specific topics. So if those people are looking for that problem solved, one, they're your customer. So they're sort of self-selected as being your customer. Um, but two, you might be the only one that's sort of really specifically solving that problem. Um, in some cases in the early days, you might want to think about three consulting times to brainstorm problems with them. You know, if somebody's got a problem, maybe you could say, hey, just reach out to me, make book a, a time with me on Talent or whatever. Um, the surface in for will talk through your problem. Easy, 30 minutes. Maybe you've got a prospect, maybe you've got a start. Um, how to webcast. So can you create your own channel mm -hmm. and can you just start broadcasting a couple of times a week? Push it out. <clears throat> so here's a problem. Most of you can probably build a product. Yeah. Some people can build a product that customers might like, <laughs> but most people can't sell enough of a product to stay in business. So here we go. So I want to take this seriously. Um, I'll tell you about a couple of incubate specific examples here. Uh, the White Hero guys um, on the left of the screen, um, they came into here and downstairs in a, in a growing basement. Mm -hmm. And in the first week we said, you need to go into your room and you need to pick up the phone and you need to call the owners of the fleet owners in Sydney. Just call them all, go find them and call them all. What they made was they made a, they had a, a polymer um, uh, washing um, liquid, so to speak, that would allow you to wash a car without using any water. Okay, which you might think, well, that's pretty cool. We're very ecologically friendly. Um, but not only that, it actually solves another big problem for fleet owners because fleet owners do not necessarily have all their cars in one spot for a start. But secondly, they don't have a car wash that can drive them through and get them clean. And yet they still have to keep them clean. So they built an on-demand, um, and, and I believe now they're, they're doing a couple of million dollars a year in revenue. They're a survivor and, and growing. And so um, they went into their room, and literally in the first couple of calls, they scored one of the biggest customers and remained the biggest customer for a couple of years. And so it's like, oh, wow, this is easy. But that, normally that's not the experience. Right? It's not normally that. Um, but they were a little bit resistant to get on the phone. They were a little bit resistant to get out there. But they did, and it literally changed the business overnight. Literally, they started working that week from an idea with a few customers here and there. They literally had a proper business running within a week or two. So it took them a while to build up more of them, but without making that initial call, they would never have got there. So you've got to start with that initial outbound contact call um, connection. Um, the other guys are now doing superbly well, but this solution you might have seen, they just raised, I think, maybe five or ten million dollars in capital, um, and they had previously raised a million. Um, I can't tell you how much revenue they're on, but it's multiple millions. Um, they basically built, in fact, it's a funny story that relates into something we'll talk about later, but they came in here with the idea of a, a, an underwater robot that could inspect hot water plants mm -hmm. and hot water systems. So uh, maybe that's not an awesome market, but the technology is super interesting. Why don't you sort of rethink about it and come back in? They're all roboticists out of um, the set of a few robotics down in Sydney, but uh, down <laughs> by the hill there. And so they didn't have it as easy, I have to say. It was much harder for them. 
but they persisted and it took them about six months of calling every single council, every single dam owner, every single waterways maintenance group like Sydney Waterways and Marine and so on and so on. But eventually they managed to get a pilot um, in one of the canals down near um, Chansey or somewhere like that uh, where they were able to do their, their automated robotic inspections and from there they're now spread across the world. They've got an office in Asia, in, sorry, in, in Middle East, uh, one in Texas, one in Sydney, and I think something in Asia. As I say, they're doing multiple millions of dollars of revenue. Um, they now got a super advanced um, uh, autonomous um, inspection. Uh, it's, a, it's a rag, I think it is. It goes under the water, so it's actually submersible and can drive itself under water. They've got machine learning experts. Uh, they must have about 15, 20 people here in Sydney I and mean, others all around the world. Um, but if they had a stop, if they had not have made that hardcore outreach, and it really was hard for them in the first six months, they'd be all back working down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that's one of them signing a deal with um, Mr. Nasir, signing a deal with um, some some guys in the Middle East. So mm -hmm. that's why we take this seriously because those two, that they will probably be seen as what um, incubators, I guess, star graduates. Some of the star graduates. But you don't know about the other 20 that went through with them that didn't make it. So, um, hello. Just be patient. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, as a, as a VC, um, these are the key things we think about. So, can you get a product to market? Do you have the sales hunger? And do you know what to do to make that all happen? Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff we think about too, but that's from a sales and marketing perspective, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, I want to talk about some of the stuff that's happened this week with Amos Fast Fortnite, with Google on Facebook. Whether you agree with what's happening in the news, whether you don't, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad, I think as startup owners, we all have to think about what the implications for us are. So when I first started doing EIR and mentoring um, at Incubate, what I used to say in the first couple of weeks of startups was, what you need to do before you leave here, you need to run enough experiments so that you have one paid method of getting new customers and getting new prospects. So one paid method. Easy to do, you can test that really quickly on Facebook or, or Google. But in the last year or two, I've been saying to startups, you have to find one unpaid method of getting new leads through the door. You want to make sure that you are not reliant on Google and Facebook. They have weaponized their algorithms against you and they're pushing you until you bid to unprofitability. They're just going to algorithmically strip your cash out of you. Mm -hmm. Now, great for testing, but if you rely on them forever, what happens if, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier today that's got a, a popular media property. Um, Facebook was their lifeblood. Wrong. You can't even post them. So all I'd say is you've got to find an unpaid channel that works. Marketing is pretty well and I'm a moving target, so that's not always going to work. You've got to keep experimenting. What works today will decrease over time and with scale. So the bigger you get, the harder that will be or won't work as well. And you need to adopt a mindset of constant experiments. So Anyway, let me, let me be a little bit clearer. Is that clear enough for everybody? Yeah. We can't trust them to look after your business. They will absolutely strip you there. So you need a channel, your own channel, to customers. You need to be able to fill that channel without being milk dry by Facebook and Google. You need to own a relationship with your customers and not have to pay a gatekeeper. And you, I would strongly advise you not to hide behind distributors or channels. Now, I only put this one in here about an hour and a half ago because I had been thinking, well, what's the update for this quarter? That's got to be the message. You cannot rely. You have to have your own connection with the customer. You cannot rely on them for acquisition. You might have to think about that from an interim perspective, but I'll just say to you that you want to actually make sure that you own that. So, um, how do we start? How do we get started? So some of the things we'll talk about later on will scale, but how do we get started? This is hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? 
There's no silver bullet. You've literally got to do the hard yards. You've got to make outbound contacts. You've got to impress yourself on the world, so to speak. And sort of this concept or this, this um, sales drive has to be baked into the business and hopefully into the product and driven by the founder. All the founders in the room, who loves sales? Not a single hand, right? Yeah, oh, there you go. Hello, we've got one. Fantastic. <laughs> Maybe you might even make a little bit. Depends on the day. Depends on what day you uh, ask. I just have to say to you, uh, and I hate to lecture, but a founder really cannot build a product and then aggregate sales responsibility to the salesperson you might have just hired. You own it until the business is big enough to hire a sales rep that you can teach how to actually replicate you. You own it. It's yours until there's enough revenue that you can fund somebody else to help do it. Does that make sense? Um, so daily and weekly sales and marketing tempo has to be a core activity of your business. It has to fit it in every day. So if you don't have time for this and you think it's not important or you think you can just delegate it to somebody, I, I think you might want to rethink that. You may be headed for failure if you do that. Just seriously think about that. Hello, why have we got an empty page? There we go. Okay, so did it come or not? It did. What happened? Mm, no, no. There we go. What do they call that? Dead air with radio. I think they call it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so developing style step is the key to making progress. But when you first start, well, how do I get started? What do I do? And everybody sort of makes a bit of a joke about this, but I talk about this concept of 10 by 10. 10 calls or 10 contacts outbound to the world by 10 a.m. every morning. We got that? Who does 10 by 10 every morning? Nobody. Yeah, you're not lying. Most startup founders are like this. There is no outbound. It's product, product, product. Not talk to a person, try my product, talk to a person, try my product. So, um, 10 calls by 10 a.m. every morning. If I did nothing else, yes? Sorry, why do you think that it should be before 10 a.m.? Do you think people are just getting ready for their day like It just has a certain <laughs> elegance to the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're up at 5 or 6 a.m., right? Right? No. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. Well, try that too. Yeah. But if you're, put it this way, but even the night village, you should be able to get 10 down by 10 a.m. But how successful could they be? Do you not think it's more efficient to do it in the afternoon when people are more kind of... Uh, more um, accepting to a call. Are they? I thought or are they winding down at the end of the day? People are much more productive in the morning, so they want to get their work done. Yeah, so maybe you could be right. Yeah. The it's reason I like it is because you put it at the front of your day and it got done. Yeah, sure. Okay, but if you left it to the end of the day, you're going to be feeling ratty and maybe you get there, maybe you want it, maybe you go to the gym, maybe you want it, <laughs> maybe you're going to have a beer, I really need to. You see what I mean? If you put the 10 by 10, stamped on your forehead or on the desk in front of you, you just nail it by 10, we're done. You can do whatever else you like for the rest of the day. Yeah? Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Don't fight it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a new world. We're all spending 12 hours a day on Zoom, right? Well, I don't know about you, are, but we are. Um, the question is, if you're not building product, what else are you doing? Can you do 100 calls a day? Or 100 outbound connections a day? Mm -hmm. Just saying, it's an objective. My record for the, for the, for the record is 160 calls, phone calls in one day. Absolutely brutal. Wouldn't ever want to do it again, but that's my record. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so when you first start, um, it'll be messy. You really won't have any systems. You won't have stuff set up. You won't be able to necessarily track what's going on with your um, prospects. And so what I'd advise you is the, the world is full of multi-billion dollar CRM businesses, but they're largely all terrible for this purpose. The purpose is for you to be able to look at a page of leads and work out where you truly are. So you can lie to everybody else, but you can't lie to yourself. So where am I really? Why are you guys laughing? You're laughing at each other. Exactly. About the problem. Problem. We had this morning. Are you having this meeting this morning? Exact meeting this morning. Happy day. <laughs> um, and so um, what you really want here is you just want to know the company, who the contact is, the deal description, what its status is, the next action, the probability of you winning, 
and then the value of that deal. And so, as I say, there's a CRM business, you absolutely should have a CRM, there's no question, but a Google spreadsheet is the best way to do this because you can't hide in a Google spreadsheet if every week the spreadsheet stays the same. Now, there's mm-hmm. some companies I see where the board pack and the prospect list stays the same every month. It's like, pull them up and against each other. That doesn't work for us. Mm-hmm. Nothing's happening. What are you doing? You can't hide from that spreadsheet. You can hide it all in a CRM. That spreadsheet it sort of hits you in the face and you can't do much with that. Um, so, everybody heard of the concept of a sales funnel? Yes, no, maybe so. Hands up. Yes, good, good, good. Okay. Oh, wait, that's great. <laughs> um, so, look, every business is different, but fundamentally they're all the same. We, we think about this concept of a, um, a conceptual funnel where lots of people come in at the top and then a small amount come out the bottom and turn into business. But not, not many people think about the fact that you've got various stages to that. And in fact, an optimal sales funnel will have a certain defined set of tasks that you want to take a customer through in order to optimise the chance of you winning that business. And it varies by industry, it varies by you know product, but each of them you can define an optimal, test it, and make it better. So it may well be, if you're in a complex, have we got any B2B sales people here? Anybody selling into business? Okay. So if you're in a business, it may well be that you need to talk to four or five people in business to close a deal. Right? So part of your funnel may well be I need to speak to the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, and maybe the CCO. And I need to send them a different message. They're all getting a different message that suits them about my product. So it appeals to a different nature. It may well be, you know, maybe a white paper, it may be a demo of the software, it may be a trial, it may be a webcast or a call. There's a whole different bunch of stuff that works. It's different for everybody else, but all I'd say to you is you have to make one for you and you have to think about what that looks like and then try to apply that to each of your people that come through the door. And as you get team members, try to get them to apply that to each of those team um, prospects that come through the door. Does it make sense? So if we do that all the time, what do we have then? We sort of have a process, right? And if we've got a process that you've designed that works for you, that closes lots of deals or, or brings in lots of new customers, you've got that process, that process can be copied into somebody else's brain and somebody else can do it for you. Or that process can be codified onto the web and a site can do it for you 24 by 7. So you just want to be thinking about how do I build that sales funnel? What is the progression? So it might be, you know, new lead comes in, quote, call, webcast, demo, whatever the list is. It's different for everybody. But just think through what that looks like. Write it down, test it out. Yeah, as an example, do you rewrite the same proposal 20 times for every new client, every new prospect that comes in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Why? Because different things we have to address it according It's the same product, product, right? But you can you can show it from different angles. Yeah, but so there should be an optimal mm-hmm. that appeals to that particular class of customer. Yes. Is there some way that you can say, here is my optimal sales template for that customer? Thank in the mm-hmm. or here is the set of data sheets or forms or spec, um, uh, a spec sheet or a, a user guide or an email guide or an implementation, whatever that optimal is, how can you codify that rather than making it up every time that you re-quote something? How can you codify that? How can you make that a process? How can you make that so that instead of it taking you half an hour or an hour to do a quote, you can now a quote in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. How, how can you do that and, and be thinking about that? Does that make sense? So we're going to talk about basic technology, a basic terminology, you're going to put my glasses on, um, at sales terminology. And this is sort of important. I'll tell you the reason in my mind why it's important. I get a very non-trivial amount of startups come to me and tell me things about their business that when on further investigation turn out not to be quite as presented, if that makes sense. So um, they might say, we've done this deal. So, okay, great, tell me about that. What revenue did you get? When did the money land? When did you deliver the product? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we, we haven't actually delivered it yet. Oh, 
Okay, so it's not quite a deal yet, is it? Have you got an order for it? No, 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 they've told us they're getting one. Okay, so it's really not a deal yet, is it? It's just actually a prospect. They might be really interested. So when, when did they, have they prepped up a, a purchase order? No, 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 they're talking to purchasing. Okay, so we don't actually have a deal yet at all. It's somebody that's interested, they're talking to you, they're told you they might be doing something, but it's actually not revenue yet. So I just want to talk about things that we think about from the perspective of um, a lead. So a lead is someone who could turn into a prospect that has an opportunity and therefore hopefully turn into a sale. A prospect is somebody that you've qualified that you know, really has a need for a product like yours. And the more certain they are, obviously the more qualified the prospect is. An opportunity is a specific requirement that a prospect might have. So if we're talking about an enterprise like a university, for example, you might be selling networks and equipment we've talked about before. You might have 10 different opportunities on this campus to sell different types of networking products, and they may be connected to each other, but they may not have been either. Or if we're talking about a multinational, you might have an opportunity to sell in the Sydney office, but there may be five other opportunities across America and the USA. So the opportunity is, you know, one prospect could have multiple opportunities. Um, so a user is somebody who uses your product, maybe paid, maybe not. Maybe they're the buyer as well, maybe they're not. A customer is somebody who actually uses, buys your product and pays for it. I just know you're a user of Facebook, for example, but you're not really a customer. You're sort of a product. Um, so we, we spoke about sales funnels before. Um, so this is, this is really important, especially if you're talking to people about fundraising. So forecasts or opportunities is where the prospect's got some interest, you qualify them, you know quite a bit about them, and they may do business with you. They have a requirement that as distinct from an order where you've actually got an order from somebody, so they've placed an order with you, either online or they've sent you a PDF or in the old days of fax or whatever, <laughs> but you've actually got an order from them. Um, sales is when you actually ship product to them and you can invoice them. So they've ordered, you ship or provided the service, you can invoice. Prepayments are when they've ordered, they want to buy, they've actually paid you, but it hasn't been shipped yet. Prepayments are great, don't get me wrong, but it's not quite sales yet because you haven't shipped it. Um, back orders, so you have an order but you can't ship it, haven't been paid for it yet. Revenue or income is sort of synonymous with sales. So you have an order, you've shipped it, and now you can have um, invoice or revenue income. Um, cash flow, so you have money coming in and out, which is generally correlated with your revenue, um, but may not necessarily happen at the same time. So for example, you could sell something on credit, but not get the cash for months. Or you could take a payment up front, but not ship it for months. Um, so gross profit is your sales minus your cost of sales. You get an accounting lesson for free here, by the way. Um, net profit is your gross profit, okay, minus your expenses. Does that make sense? Okay. I could probably put that on a nice slide out for the next one. Just so. um, I want to tell you a story about capital and about cash flow that I think is important for you to understand as you start building. Almost nobody will tell you this story because they don't really teach it in business school, maybe in MBAs, but certainly not in undergrads. Um, if you look at how your cash is affected as you grow your business, there's a bunch of things that contribute to cash. Expenses, cost of goods sold, sales, money coming in from sales, money going out to things like payroll or um, uh, taxation, mm -hmm. whatever it is, to, whatever it might be. So. There's a bunch of ways you can get cash into the business. You sell cash in, you can raise money from people, um, VCs or angels, or whatever it might be. You can borrow money from people, banks, credit cards, mm -hmm. so on. Um, but your growth will forever be capped by how quickly you can generate cash. The faster you can generate cash, the better you have, or the greater chance of you being able to actually grow your revenue, if that makes sense. An example I'll give you is back in the day when we were first sort of you know, rolling out the IT infrastructure of the world, so to speak, um, Hewlett Packard and Dell were two business models that were super competitive against each other. HP had a scenario where they would actually build a product, literally hundreds of millions of products, so 
ship them out to warehouses where they sat for 15, 30, 45 days at a distributor. A reseller would buy those where they sat for another week or whatever and then would finally deliver to the customer. HP wouldn't get paid for those products for 60 days, maybe, maybe longer in some cases. Um, the processor industry is somewhat like the fish markets. It's good today, but it sort of goes off pretty quickly after that. So, you know, processors degrade in value literally on a daily, daily basis. So the stock that you've got sitting in the channel for all that time actually gets that, you know, lower value each week, and you end up writing off a chunk of it. Dell had a different approach. Dell's approach was to say, if you're a supplier to us, you are within an hour of our factory. When we order a product, we expect it there in the next couple of hours. You're going to park your truck here, and when we tell you, you're going to drive it across the line, and when you do, that's when you can invoice us. HP, they just ship product to them and invoice them when they left. Dell was like, you can call it crosses the line, we don't know. They also had the situation where they took the order from a customer and said, this is going to take us 14 days to ship this to you. Okay, um, but we'll take your money now. Yeah, that's for most of their customers in the early days. Later on, they started to do a lot more credit, but they originally did a lot of work where it was like, you have to pay for it online before you can actually place an order. So they had the money for 14 days before they were expected to supply the goods. The product showed up, and they didn't have to pay them for 60 days. So what happened to their cash flow as their sales increased? Exactly. Their cash flow went up. And so if you think this through, they got the money in 14 days before they had to supply. They didn't actually hold any stock until literally the day that they were assembling the product. They shipped the product out 14 days afterwards, but they've been holding the customer's money for that 14 days. They don't have to pay this customer, the supplier, for 60 days or so. So every time you sell more, your cash flow increases. HP, on the other hand, had to buy the product here. Maybe they got some credit, but they bought the product. They shipped it. It sat in the channel, distribution, and finally got to the end user maybe 60 days later. But they didn't see their money for 60 days. So what happens to them when they sell more? If they double their revenue, what happens? Cash flow goes down. Cash flow goes down, working capital requirements go massively up. Right. Something to think about for your business. Does that make sense? Yes. So, long and short way of saying that get your money up front if you can, fantastic. So, mm -hmm. take your order, get cash straight away. Um, yeah, anyway. So, um, we spoke about some of these things already, I think. Does anybody have any questions about the ones on this page? Mm -hmm. No? Um, okay, so we spoke about the first couple there, but so if we look, when we're talking about tempo, if you look, for example, are you able to measure how many leads you're getting every week? So how many people are making an inquiry? Everybody got a website now? Mm -hmm. Okay. How many inquiries are we getting a week, a day? You can probably answer. How many? Me? How many? Yeah. How many uh, leads are you getting a week? Six last week. So you need to be able to keep a tempo of how many leads you're getting or a measurement of how many leads you're getting every week. Because if the lead machine stops, what happens? No sales. No sales. Ah. Right, so you have to keep that tempo, keep that measurement, put it up on the whiteboard somewhere, update it every Monday or Friday afternoon, whatever it might be. Make that a focus. You've got to keep that happening. Um, so what does it cost you per lead? You can probably tell me that too, can't you? Or not? Oh, you do a lot of yours for me, don't you? But this is Google Ads. This is for Google Ads for some paid ads. Yes, yeah, so it costs a click, all of that. But for example, with Instagram, how can I see, all right, I can see just the number of likes, but I cannot understand what is the post, like, because it is for free for me. So that won't be applicable. So it would be just for paid ads. Um, right, but there is real time in generating that. Mm -hmm. But if, for example, there's a bit of your time, but you get 100 leads out of it, that mm -hmm. would have otherwise cost you $500 on Google AdWords, it's arguable that your cost of goods sold for that set of leads that you generated is much higher. Mm -hmm. The only trouble is there's only one of you, and you can only do that for so long. But, that, you know, in that case, you have measured and you have a better cost of acquisition in that method than in. For example, the AdWords and the mm -hmm. So you want to be able to track your um, 
customer acquisition cost. This is hard in the early days when you're doing a hard stock, but it becomes easier as you do more programmatic or where you've got you know, advertising that you're paying for. Um, lifetime value of the customer, so how much will you earn out of that customer? Mm -hmm. Is it one deal? You ship one product, maybe they're never a customer again? Or does that turn into an ongoing stream of business from them for one year, two years, five years, forever? Um, what are you paying cost per click or CPM, as they call it in the advertising industry, what are you cost out of paying per thousand impressions? These are things to be thinking about. Okay, so I call this the learning diet the dance syndrome um, and because <laughs> And the reason I call that is that a lot of guy who dance will dance with anybody who will dance with him or sell him. So most startups are somewhat similar to that in that you will talk to anybody that shows an interest in your product, whether they are necessarily the right target market for you or not. Mm -hmm. And we spoke before about um, the guys from Abyss who originally came into this and was building a underwater robotic a robotic device to go in through hot water pipes into commercial hot water systems. Mm -hmm. Big market, right? It might be, but I've never heard of it before. But it, it didn't seem like a big market. The reason they'd chosen it was one of their neighbours was a commercial hot water person mm -hmm. and had shown interest in what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, hey, we're in the commercial hot water business. That's what we're doing. We're building a product for that. So there was no talk of the fact that they're now helping out oil and gas companies with thousands of assets around the world that are worth millions of dollars each, that was not even thought of. But they, they told people with, you know, like for example, I think they did the Hoover the Dam or something, didn't they? Um, you know, they did the underwater inspection for the Hoover Dam. They weren't thinking about that because the guy next door was interested in them and he had a problem with these hot water systems. Mm -hmm. So, um, the question you've got to ask yourself is, you, you, most people are normally sort of tech first and customer later. Have you picked the right segment? Did you actually consciously pick that segment? Did you look at it and do a stack rank of all the different segments that your product or technology could actually um, address? Why did you pick that segment? What made you do it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so if we think about how you can stack rank that, as an example, a test that I just like to use for people, can you go to LinkedIn right now and find 50 prospects of people who need your product? People with the right job title, people in the right company, mm -hmm. right size of company, right geographic location, authority to purchase style people. Can you find 50 people? If you can't right now, you might be in the wrong segment. You might be in the right segment too, by the way, but you could be in the wrong segment. So I just sort of say, yeah, have a think a really serious thing about what segment you're going after. Now, back in the day, we were lucky enough to feel Packer to be trained um, using a, a methodology um, created by Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm and Inside the Tornado. We talk about this early adopter market. Right now, you're all bringing new products to market, and effectively, you're in the very early stage, which most of you can't see down here. And so, hopefully, they're all like that. Hopefully, there's no old, old age. Um, products that you're bringing to market. <laughs> and so um, your job is to work out how to get to that very early market. The good news is about that very early market is in a lot of cases they don't have great solutions. In a lot of cases they might be very willing to put up with your crappy product while you're actually making your product better because they might not have an alternative. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we talk about this concept called the dolling up. And essentially what we're saying is in any given market, you can probably subcategorize that market into areas of micro niches, for one of a better term. Now, everybody will say you've got to go for a massive market, and that's sort of true, but at the same time, you need to get a foothold. So the question is, where can you get a foothold? What market can you appeal to? We're early stage technology, so we need to build a solution that probably really targets and really well addresses segment one or whatever segment one is for you. And so you might want to think about how do I build the best optimal product just for that segment and go and own that segment and have that market love you. Mm. And then move to the segments adjacent to that 
once you start to get a bit of traction, you get some cash flow, you get some sales, everybody thinks you know is what you know what you're doing, and you move to the next product segment, and the next product segment, and so on. Mm -hmm. The best examples I can give you of this are technology companies. Um, Autodesk, that you may have heard of, Adobe. How many products have those companies released? Literally, we're talking hundreds plus each. And they, what they did was they started out, they dominated a niche, moved to the next one. Dominated a niche, moved to the next one. Here, that was another great example. You know, 70, 80 years worth of products that address a really tight niche and then moved to the next one. They used to actually have a technique for it. They called it the next bench technique, which was we built this product. But on the way to building this product, we actually needed all these other products. So we're going to go build them now. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, but it's an interesting example of how you find out what what the next product might be. Um, so, I mean, I'll just show you to the place that you want to look for that segment. Obviously, you need to be able to find them, but what you want is the people that are experiencing extreme pain and will do anything to get rid of it. So, what is the pain that they're trying to solve? Can you provide a solution to them, even if it's a bit, can you say, suboptimal, maybe underdeveloped, a bit crappy? But will that actually help them? Will they put up with your dodgy product? Well, not that you've got dodgy products, they're all probably wonderful. But they're probably all early as well. They're probably not the products that are the result of $10 million worth of development effort. So, how do you get, well, yours might be, right? You've got the, yours are out there, they're already working, right? Yeah. Anyway, so you, you may not be the, uh, the person. So, how do you get the person that's got the most pain that really needs this problem solved? And start with that segment. Who has a match pain? <laughs> so, um, so what's your ideal customer look? You should be able to tell me who your ideal customer is. Is it business? Is it consumer? Is it government? What size are they? What location? What's their tech stack look like? If you're technical people, what do you, you know? What is it that is going to be appealing to them? What, how do you fit into their technical stack? Who's the ideal decision maker? Is there more than one decision maker? What message do you have to tell them? Can you get them? Are you able to get them via LinkedIn? Can you get them via some other means? How do you get in contact with these people? Mm -hmm. I've stolen this from a, an old mate of mine, Adrian McMahon, who was formerly a vice president of Hewlett Packard, and him and, him and I started pretty well on the same week at AP. Um, he went off overseas, but he now works for a company called GitLab, who is growing very, very quickly, probably $100 million a year of business for IPO sometime in next year or two. He runs the Asia Pacific group. Can you, everybody see that okay? Yeah, not that cool. And so um, he talks about the playbook. And for him, it's like, we've got people over here on the left-hand side who aren't buying a product. We've got people that we're moving through the funnel that are on the community edition. Um, and some of those might actually be helping us with the community edition. And then we've got people over here who are paying for it. But above them, we've got VPs, managers, directors, and then above them, we've got the C-level. So this is a very enterprise discussion. If you're selling to a consumer, I'm sorry, this is maybe not the optimal use of your time. But each of these groups will have different messaging. So he's got up there, for example, the CXO was around a strategic sort of imperative of accelerating the whole business. You know, the, the management level was about being able to keep the servers running, to be able to manage the servers that you've got, the applications you've got. The developers was how do, we, how do I make it more efficient? And so each level of the business that he had to sell to, he had a different message for that was tailored to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so his job was to move people across from never having heard of a product to trying a product with the community to then actually paying for the community. And then at the same time, get that message up through the business about why they should look at and pay for this product. So what's your playbook? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. What's the process? What, who are you signing to? What, what do they do? What messaging do they want to hear in order for you to be able to close a deal? Um, does everybody hear love sayings? Have you all love sayings? Yeah. We all love it. Depends on the day. <laughs> There's a reason a lot of people don't love sounds. They sort of think it's a bit icky, a bit dirty, a bit, you know, lower brow, not so desirable. But salespeople people create 
in some cases, a bad impression in their mind. And you know, that's sort of deserved in some ways. But what I'll say to you is a great salesperson creates value in the mind of the customer. So how did you demonstrate the value to the customer of your product? So you're not just trying to jam it down their throat. In fact, if it's not suitable for you, your job is to walk away. But if, if this is actually good for them, how do you actually educate them about how much value there is in this product for them? But you can't do that until you understand what value is about or what value is to them. So face-to-face -face meetings. Sorry for all the points. If you're on the live stream, this is going to be really painful. So uh, i just make a couple of comments about meeting equity, uh, equity uh, tongue-tying <laughs> problem here, etiquette. So my objective any time I go into any meeting with an investor or with a startup or whatever, I don't want to talk. I want to give a brief intro, which might not be obvious from this presentation, but I want to give a brief intro and I want, to, um, I want them to talk. And I want them to talk for half an hour if I can. If we've got an hour meeting, and I can get them to talk for half an hour about what their business is going through, what's important to them, what challenges they've got. I've got a so much better idea of being able to make sure that if we've got a solution for them, how we can illustrate the value of that solution to them. So I'd advise you to sort of give a brief overview of who you are, but then say, look, I really, it's sort of important to me, I want to understand what your challenges are. What, what, what are you going through? What are you looking for? What's important to you? What issues have you had in the past? And keep asking questions until they literally run out of things to, to answer with you. Um, if you can do that for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, you, you've got to win because all of a sudden, most people don't listen to the customer. Most <laughs> people just blindly blurt out their pitch for half an hour and walk out the door. The client hasn't said anything and they don't know anything, they didn't learn anything, they didn't get the order. But if you can get the customer to listen, or should I say, for you to listen to them, and for them to open up and tell you what's important, at least then you know you're in the right spot and you can tailor your product pitch to them. So, um, i just make a very interesting point here for the young men in the room, maybe the older men as well in the room as well. You need to be really careful about engaging everybody in the room. Um, International Women's Day is coming up shortly. Just yeah, put the flag out there. You can book a time with me. It's on my Twitter mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, make sure you engage all the people at the table because you never know who the decision maker is. And I set through a really embarrassingly painful pitch with a startup that was pitching something to a woman and a man. And I knew more about a woman and a man than they did. And they just pitched up about the whole time, whole time didn't hardly reference a woman. She was the decision maker, it turns out. <laughs> but they didn't pay any attention whatsoever. If you don't know who the decision maker is in the room, you can engage with them all. So, um, yeah, it, it's sexist, rude, bad for business. Um, so, this is what we want you to build. We want you to build a lead generation machine. So, you put money in, you turn the handle, <laughs> and out comes business. That's conceptually what we want to do. And while we're sitting here, we probably had, let me just tell you what we've had. Have we had anybody come through the stack? <laughs> so while we've just been sitting here, we've had three deals come through the deal flow, and we have had yeah. only two people come through the email. So I can tell you that because bang, it appears on my phone all the time. So in your case, what can we get? But, Get those leads, get those deals coming through all the time. But for you to be able to do that, you've got to be able to track those and automate those. You have to be able to manage them because otherwise it just turns into a big cog mine you can't deal with it. So, the first thing I'd say to you is you have to do a CRM. I know I sort of slaved the CRMs off earlier, but you do need a way in which you can um, track all your digital interactions and a, a way that you have a landing page that will capture that lead, feed it into your system, make you aware of it, and then store it so that you can manage it. Have we all got that yet? Mm -hmm. We have. Everybody's got that? Everybody's got lead flow. You, you can tell me right now how many leads you've got this week. Not me, but we've just had a pop spot and my partner. Ah, fantastic. Well. That's good. 
we'll just say it, it just it talks Club Sport, yes. Club Sport, yeah, that's an expensive addiction, but... <laughs> <laughs> Close CRM? Sorry? Close CRM? Yeah, but you might have seen that off my recommendation a week ago. Mm -hmm. you have it already. Oh, I've had, used it for months now. Yeah, it's okay. great. Well, excellent. So, um, there's a bunch of them out there. Some of them are going to eventually skin you alive, but anyway, that's the last. Um, you really need to make sure we've got those integrated, but you want that set up so that your lead form feeds straight into the system. And maybe, and this is a little, everybody likes the notifications on, on um, Facebook when people like your product, right? Or on Twitter when people you know, give you a retweet or give you a like. Well, they're even better when you see leads come through this Slack channel. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's, that's adrenaline, dopamine hit <laughs> every time. If you see a new lead come through there, that's just like, bang, I'm onto it. And the reason you want to be bang, I'm onto it, is that if it sits in your inbox for the day, leads are also somewhat like fish. They go off, okay? <laughs> if you leave them for a day, the chances of you closing them gets much lower. If you can respond to them in a couple of hours or less, the chances of you actually getting them while they're still thinking about the problem is much higher and therefore being able to engage and, and do that. So I advise you to hook this up until it gets to a point where it's so noisy you can't deal with it anymore. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy to do, you use Zapier. You can probably connect HubSpot through the Slack straight away, maybe close through the Slack straight away as well. If not, you can use Zapier to do that. Um, now, email drip feed. You're doing emails out to people, people are emailing you. Are you capturing every one of those people in your CRM? Some of you might be if you've got a HubSpot connector, mm -hmm. but a lot of people aren't doing this. And you'll, you'll see thousands upon thousands of emails come in and out of your exchange server or your office server um, during the lifetime of your business. Literally thousands, could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Why didn't every one of those get an invite to subscribe to your email address? your email newsletter, should I say. That literally will be thousands of people that contact you. Why wouldn't they get an invite to subscribe to the newsletter? So you can automate that too. Hook it up via Zapier, you can connect it up to Gmail, so that every new inbox, so let's just say there's one of you today, but there's five of you in six months' time, are everybody there entering everybody into the CRM? Is there all the other five people religiously updating the CRM with that new contact? Mm. Unlikely, right? It'd be really nice, but it often doesn't happen like that. But if you're sending them out a newsletter, if you've actually made contact with them and said, oh, thanks so much, um, that, you know, I'm the founder and I really appreciate you talking, you know, contacting our team, um, would you subscribe to our newsletter? Mm -hmm. That will increase your newsletter people. Now, what most people don't realise is that when people say, uh, I'm not ready to do something right now, it's not no forever in many cases. It's often, I'm just not ready now. Uh, in six months' time or 12 months' time, uh, I'm probably ready. But just as now, I'm interested and you know, I'm doing a bit of research, but I'll come back to you. But here's the reality. Unless you made contact with them and kept in front of them, the chances of them coming back to you are pretty low, right? They're just going to Google it, and whoever's paid for the top page of Google is going to get the lead, not you. But if you, oh, I'm sorry, I just spoke to my Google phone. <laughs> uh, so if you are, uh, if you're emailing them once a month or once a fortnight, if you're sending them out uh, an interesting, informative newsletter about the industry, the chances are you're going to be top of mind for them in 12 months' time when you come back. Mm -hmm. which means that the money that you spent to get them today is not wasted and burned. You're just not going to see it for 12 months. But if you don't keep track of them, you're never going to see it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, email drip feed, new people in through the site, maybe if they've made an inquiry about your product, maybe you want to launch a drip feed. HubSpot can do this, lots of others can do this. The drip, speed, the drip feed might need five messages over the space of five weeks that illustrate the value of your product to them. Hopefully you stop sending that to them if they buy off you, but often that doesn't happen. But ideally you would be able to stop them from getting the drip feed if they buy off you, but it might take them that five weeks to make the decision. Or you may keep in front of them top of mind for that five weeks. Or it may be a year, you just don't know. But by sending out the drip feed, you can keep 
So this is not your newsletter, this is a pre-programmed, a step-by-step, what are the five, ten things, remember we spoke before about the funnel, what are the things that we have to tell them, that we have to demonstrate to them in order for them to buy? Mm. What are those steps? And so if you can send out each week a new group feed that says, we want to tell you about this feature because our customers have found this super valuable. Bang. You scored a goal, they now understand that feature, they think that's great. You do it again next week with a different feature, with a different taste of it. That keeps you in front of them over a period of time, keeps them along until they're ready to do something. And you know, when people come to your website, you've got 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and most of them are gone. Some of them might hang around for a little bit longer. They're not going to absorb your whole message, even assuming you've managed to work out what your whole message is and put it on the website properly. They're not going to absorb that in a 15, 20 second visit. So how do you keep them coming back? Um, so some of the things that work really well, people say they hate them, people always tell me, oh, I hate pop-ups, I hate registrations, I hate this. Yeah, sure. But you know what? It grows your, your people on the newsletter like nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know, we've tested this where we've had certain different types of pop-ups, and over a, a one-month period, we've got some that have produced, you know, 5, 10, 15, we've got others that have produced 100 in the same time. You know, one example comes to mind where we've done nearly 500 on three months. So, the difference can be quite outstanding on whether you get that right or get that wrong. Mm -hmm. They would not, we wouldn't have got almost any sign-ups if there wasn't a pop-up there. Yeah. I know it's going to be different for each sort of type of visitor segment, but what did you find worked best in terms of delay from when they first get there to the pop-up appearing or scroll depth? Or? Yeah, look, what, I, I think it's a bad idea to make a bang show away. Um, I think it's a good idea that once they get over, say, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, where they've obviously started to get a bit interested in it, that's possibly the optimal time to, to spring would be my... Might be. Okay. Yeah. But test it. You know, try different ways. Do you can do with things like um, uh, opt-in monster. You can do a split. Uh, what do you call it? Um, a B test, where you might have a duration of ten seconds and a duration of a minute, and you can see, or you can might change the message. Um, there's a bunch of different split tests you can do to work out which ones work better and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. um, but test it is, is a reality. But I think if you hit them, the only thing you can probably hit them with straight away when they come in is if you've got a notifications um, pop up, in other words, that allows to send you notifications. So it's not an email, it's basically allowing the browser um, or the mobile to get a notification when you publish a new post. Um, that one you can probably, it's fairly unobtrusive, you can probably do that when they land, but a proper email captures pop up. Probably 30 seconds. So, um, these get a bit harder to do as you go along, but as you get more resources, I would be attempting to try to do this. What you want to try and do is track your lead source, so where the lead came from, religiously. The reason why you want to be able to do this is you want to be able to attribute it. What do you spend from what channels and spend more money in those channels? So if you're doing Google and Facebook and then you're in community outreach and it costs you zero to do community outreach and you've got the same amount of leads, what are you going to do? You're going to do more community outreach, right? Because you know Google and Facebook are going to take your money off you, but if you can get a lower cost of acquisition for your community efforts, that's what you're going to do. But you can't work out the cost of acquisition by channel unless you know where they came from. So you've got to work out how to do it. There's a science behind this on the web, the tracking links, um, sources, so on and so on. Other people know about that much better than me, but just start to look at it as a way of working out where my leads actually came from, where the successful sales came from. Um, and we spoke about real-time instrumentation. I would, in the early days, hook all your systems up to site. You want to know when people are subscribing. As I say, it's a dope of money here. And it's like, how do I get more? Um, purchases, support calls, everything. Make to generate a Slack channel. When it gets too noisy, carve your Slack channels up. Maybe not everybody gets all the notifications. But in the early days, it's actually, I find it to be really good. It's sort of like a flywheel effect. You know, you feel the flywheel moving, things are turning. It's actually exciting. Um, 
There's a couple of tools like statement.io where you can connect all your data into multiple sources. Um, Google Analytics, all sorts of other things that, that's worth thinking about. So, excuse me for one second. Um, so, we, we said before about being a celebrity, about getting around a microphone. There's absolutely, and it's never been more apparent, but there's absolutely real dollars mm -hmm. in being a celebrity in your industry. So obviously you're not going to be on um, what was the popular Keeping celebrity show. Sorry? Keeping up with the Kardashians. We're not doing that, right? <laughs> but I mean, what do those people do? Nothing. I don't know, but they make really large businesses for nothing, right? Yes. I mean, so that, that on its own will tell you that there's something there that you can work out how to harness. Now, you're not going to be kind of general, um, but you might be. But um, mm -hmm. I'd say to you that you know, she built, well, what, back then when I wrote this last year, it was like $300 million makeup business. I think it's a lot more than that now. But from the, the, the allegedly, the true story, allegedly true story, is that she built up a handful of staff from her mother's kitchen table, just based off her followers. So you look at somebody like Jason Carl Thomas, he's got something like 300,000 followers, you know, 150, 200,000 listeners to his podcast every week. Um, I think I last heard... I mean, Becky just did their podcast, and they're the 11th most popular podcast in America at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of people, right? Do you think he has any problems getting deal flow or advertisers or anything like that? Not a problem at all, right? What would it mean to you, though, if you were the most um, respected and followed person in your industry segment? So if you've got thousands of followers, if you've got people that listen to you and respect you, what would that do for your profile? What would that do for your business? Brings you more customers, more clients, more trust, goodwill, all of that. So it just automatically... Exactly, right? right? And so you're the one that the, the journalists from the Financial Review reach out to for comment about particular story. Yes. You're the one who gets invited on the panel up in front of a thousand people, not the one that's sitting down the back in the corner and not talking to anyone. <laughs> so you're the one that gets the limelight, you get the spotlight, and by extension, you're the one that's invited to do a lot of the interesting things, the podcasts, the TV interviews, the article interviews. Now, if you're just doing this in startup lane, that doesn't matter, unless you're selling to startups. If you what you want to be doing is you want to be doing this in your industry segment. So what was yours again? Um, um, education. Yeah, education and migrations. Mm. I'm usually the I usually come to SBS uh, Russia and just uh, providing interviews on migration issues, all the changes, all of that. So and they usually go to some immigration forums. Use your microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, also some immigration uh, forums, uh, online conferences for immigration issues. Right, so I mean, why wouldn't you, for example, you've got people coming in from China, and maybe not as many as we had a year ago, but you've got people coming in from all around the world. Why wouldn't you become the expert on talking in this space? I mean, you've got 15,000 followers, you've probably already run that path. But, you know, some of the others, you might become the experts in your segment. How do you get to be that person? Um, this one just blows me away. Um, <laughs> so this woman can sell almost anything, and literally, you know, audience of sort of 40 million or so, 6.5 million commission, 2019, and sells all sorts of different products. She's a celebrity just for selling stuff. So how do you become that go-to person? How do the journalists call you for comment? How do you get invited? In my mind, there's probably the right way to do this is that you need to become opinionated and broadcast. So how do you actually, well, first of all, you've got to have an opinion, so that's sort of you know, one thing. So you've got to develop that opinion. But I think you have to put that opinion out there in the world and test it and push it out to people and be really pointed and make a statement about what you believe about the product and the industry and the place that you're in. Um, you know, video and audio really is, and you know, this week Clubhouse and maybe Twitch and a few others, they really are the new TV and radio. Okay, well, what have we got this week? What's our new one we're just using? Oh, uh, we're using StreamYard. StreamYard, cool. Is anybody actually on it? Me? Oh, that's <laughs> it. Okay, that's not really, um, that doesn't work out so well. 
Um, so, you know, teach yourself to get on the specialist industry shows, you know, as an interview, or even better, as a panelist when you discuss industry news. You know, maybe um, the person who's running the podcast in your space, maybe he can't handle, you know, running an interview a couple of times a week. Maybe he would actually, she would actually appreciate you actually volunteering to do, you know, the news edition. You write it all up, you and, and them do the news edition together. And then all of a sudden, your name's in front of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people. Um, can you make your own regular content about your industry, demonstrating your product? So, can be written, can be video, can be audio. What, what can you actually do? There? Can you get your customers to do that for you? That's even better. So, I'll give you an example. This guy um, is an also, a former incubate guy, um, he has a product called Masso. Now, um, Masso is a fairly, what do you say? It's a fairly niche product. It's basically uh, the brains for a 3D um, laser cutter or a CNC router machine. It's basically the brain CPU that goes into fairly specialised um, cutting equipment or milling equipment or machining equipment. Um, so you wouldn't think there's that many people out there that want them, but apparently that's how they do lots of small-scale manufacturing. And so when I last checked sort of 12, 18 months ago, he had 85,000 views on his YouTube channel. But the interesting thing is he actually started a program called Make With NASA, where he basically gave a discount to anybody that would take his product and demonstrate them making something using his product. So they put the product into the, the machine and then they made a YouTube video about the piece of the part of our machine and how this was a better outcome for them. It's not stuff that really appeals to me so much, but it gets a lot of views and it generates a lot of business and it got cost syndicated across lots of other people's YouTube channels. So all of a sudden, instead of him spending his money on ads on Facebook or Google, he's actually got all these people selling his product for nothing, demonstrating his product for nothing, telling everybody how fantastic it is after they paid the money for it. How good is that? Wouldn't everybody love their product being sold by their customer for it? How do we get that? Um, this one will appeal to you because Lainey and Sylvia were sort of in your seat about, it must be five years ago now, I think. Um, they uh, were doing um, what's called the sorting hat. So they were basically an immigration slash university selection um, service. But what they did back early in the day was when screening first started happening in a meaningful way, they would actually walk around the various campuses of Sydney, of this university and others, and they would live broadcast their experience, they would interview people, they would get into 10,000 viewers in the space of you know a couple of weeks. So that did they did that basically each week as a period. Now that business did not work out. But I thought it was a really interesting experiment about how do I get a mass market of people that are interested? What can I do that might actually make that happen? Mm -hmm. Now this one's a bit harder in this current day and age, meet up some conferences. Um, but you can get this you can get into the market with this really quickly. If you go and have a look at meetup.com or LinkedIn Bricks, some of those are running events right now, this week, in your topic area, in your city. So Meetup literally has thousands of events going on any mm -hmm. given day around the world. Let's just say, for example, you said, I'm going to go and speak to every link and Meetup group on my topic in Australia. It might take you a couple of weeks to do it, but you could hit every single one of those and talk to all the people on that. You could volunteer your time to talk about a subject. You could get in front of 50, 100 people. I mean, it's, it's fairly, what do you say, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat stuff, mm -hmm. but you could get in front of a whole bunch of people that could become the early evangelist to your product. Um, it's good for building relationships as well. You might pick up staff there, you might pick up customers there. Um, so, I think that's a really easy way to get out there. You know, conferences, it takes a bit longer to get on the circuit, but why wouldn't you get invited as the 
as a keynote speaker or as a panelist. We easily get invited as a panelist on our know, particular topics, but normally they'll start looking for panelists two or three months out. When you, when you know a, a, a conference is coming up in your space, pitch them, put up the thing. I want, I'm, I'm, I've got this paper I'm presenting on XYZ or this presentation I'm doing or this case study I'm doing. Can I, can I get on your conference ticket? And there's a decent chance if it's interesting, you'll get a gig. Um, you might want to learn how to public speak if you can. Go do a Toastmasters course. I think they're fantastic. Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, look, you've just got to be authentic. You know, you've got to come out the real you've got to come out. You don't want to be sort of, um, what would you say? You don't want to be a fake person. You, you want the real person to come out. Um, now, this is interesting, I think, if you are definitely in an emerging space or an area that isn't covered very well by mainstream media, if there's no super popular newsletter for your topic, you should start one. Mm -hmm. And even if there is one, you should start one anyway. Because if you can keep in front of that audience, if you can get people, there's, there's sort of like aggregation spots for your target audience. You know, it's a hot spot of people who are, by their nature, interested in what you're talking about. So how do you grow that newsletter list from 1,000 to 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, we spoke about you know drip feeding, and we spoke about you know Facebook. Well, not so much Facebook this week, but LinkedIn and so on. Um, those have good groups, and some of those groups, like for example, Sydney Startup Group, got six thousand, twelve thousand people starting it now. It's huge. You know, if you're starting to start up, that might be a place where you can start to get a bit of a name for yourself somehow. Not being overly promotional, but by helping, contributing assisting other people in the group. Um, cold email. I'll give you a warning, you must take note of the requirements of the standard in Australia, just putting it out there. Um, but the reality is you need to somehow get into the inbox of your client. There's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, LinkedIn's quite good because you can pay a fee and they'll get you into the link in inbox. It's not as effective as email, but depending on your jurisdiction, it might be more appropriate method. Um, you can use an email check to make sure the email is right. Um, Personalise your message is my advice. Do not bulk spam people. It's just, it's going to get you into trouble. It's against the law. Do not bulk spam. spam. Um, write a personalised introduction for each email. Now you can, what do you say, modify a similar personal introduction for lots of people. But I just say you, you do not want to bulk spam people. That just doesn't work very well. Um, what you want to try to do in the early days is just get that person on a Zoom call. Actually talk to them. Get some feedback about your product. Or walk them through your product. Demonstrate it. Um, and then you've got to keep that email, that contact you want to keep it relatively short and easy for them to respond to. Does that make sense? Um, and then later on, drip email campaign as appropriate. Um, cold calling is much harder now than it used to be, especially now that people aren't in the office as much. This may still work for some industries. I'm not recommending it. That's maybe I would have five or ten years ago when the office buildings were full of everybody. Um, and, you know, everybody's on their own private mobiles now, so they're not listed anymore necessarily. Um, so I, I just say it may be appropriate for some of your situations, but it's going, it's becoming less effective. Um, door knocking is probably not useful for any of you, um, but if you were saying you sell to um, uh, facilities, right, to, um, to, to restaurants or bars or hotels or whatever it might be, see, door knocking can work for you. It's hard to swallow, but door knocking can work for you because you can go to the front desk of the hotel and say, oh, listen, it is the first thing manager in. Um, I, I just need to tell them about something that's pretty important to them. And I'll say, no, 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 it gives, you know, gives you details, we'll get a message. It's like, yeah, okay, sure, what was the name again? Um, or you can go look it up on LinkedIn or whatever, I want to speak to, you know, um, Ms. Jones or whoever. That way you can actually, might actually get five minutes to talk to the person about that situation. Go to 30, 40 of those in an afternoon in the city, you're going to get some business, something will happen. 
You might learn something. Might not be good, it might be good. But you'll learn something. Um, yeah, if you can find a sales rep who has survived and made money by doing this, hire them. Um, you, you've done this personally? My first job in Australia was Don Logan on behalf of AGL. I yeah, worked right. there for two years and got some awards from AGL. Wow. So it was really, really interesting experience, but I really appreciate the time. So it was really, very good. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, my respect to you. That's a hard job. <laughs> Um, okay, now everybody discounts this one, but I'll tell you there's a reason why your mailbox is still jammed with um, with, with, the, with junk mail. It actually does work for some segments, not for all segments, but here's the thing, with at least in Australia, you are able to go to Australia Post and you're able to say, please send this pack of printed postcards to all of the business addresses, all the farm addresses, all the retail addresses, all the residential addresses for this postcode. So it's actually fairly the geographic, um, or to say slice and dice there, mm -hmm. which allows you to hit a bunch of people that at a pretty cost effective rate, last time I checked was about 25 cents per delivery. You know, it's pretty cheap, right? You know, why wouldn't you hit every single commercial retail commercial or street address commercial in the CBD, for example. Over the years in my first business, I sent out maybe 150,000 of these things over the time. It made money every time we sent them. In your case, you might actually put that in. It goes to the office manager usually or whoever handles the mail. Somebody looks at it, they get put into the top drawer of people's, what do you call it, um, drawers all the time. Mm -hmm. And they pull them out in fair months time and say, oh yeah, right. I needed that, now I need it, let's go. Um, test it, it's really cheap for you to test, you know, it costs you a couple hundred bucks to print, a couple hundred bucks to send you first couple of thousand. It's worth trying. Um, and especially if you're trying to expand into Melbourne or Brisbane or Perth or Adelaide, Tasmania, you're not going to go there necessarily <laughs> and do the cold calls yourself, but this could be an easy way of you scaling that distribution without actually having to go there. Um, yeah. Okay, so LinkedIn, I probably don't need to tell you too, too much about LinkedIn, but interestingly, we see in some cases more engagement out of LinkedIn than out of Facebook, and in some cases, even more engagement out of LinkedIn than Twitter. So, and where the follower ratio in my case is like five to one Twitter to LinkedIn, very much. And so, you know, in some audiences, some some um, product spaces, LinkedIn can be super good for you. Um, you can go and find those people. You can, you know, if you pay the hundred dollars a month, you can target down to the person type, their job, their location, the company type. It's actually pretty granular. You can get really tight data about that. You can then email out to them, or you can somehow connect with them on LinkedIn by sending them an email or something of that effect. Um, there's lots of ways you can slice and dice that tool. It's a really valuable resource, especially if you're selling B2B. Um, I like Twitter because I feel it's like a broadcast medium, so to speak. You know I like Twitter. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it's very good for finding the lead users or thinkers of your industry, but it's great for being able to broadcast your view. And it's particularly good, for example, if you do a a tweet storm, so 5, 10, 15 tweets all triggered together about a particular topic. That's actually pretty effective. It usually gets a fair bit of engagement um, around the industry or about what's happening. So, yeah, at the very least, this will let you get a bit of conversation going with interesting people. People will connect to you, people will follow you. And then maybe there's a DM, there's somewhere that you can, you know, discuss whether you can get given a Zoom call. It's only automated, it's really tempting to automate it, but the value comes from sort of being authentic. So, um, yeah, it all tends to happen on Twitter first. Facebook, we just move on from this this week, I think. <laughs> well, is anybody's Facebook page not working? Mm -hmm. Can everybody post on their Facebook page at the moment? We've got a couple you can't. Um, you just need to be findable on here. Facebook groups can be really valuable. If there isn't a Facebook group around your topic, around your niche, start one. 
Keep on going. Try and three or four other people to contribute. Start the Facebook group for your nation. People will start joining it. They'll start joining in. They'll start contributing. They'll start pushing content in there. From, you know, that will help you. Um, so here's an interesting concept for you. What would you do if you had a content machine that pushed out content all the time that got inbound traffic by virtue of the content? Could you, in some way, we go to step past the newsletter, and could you have a medium um, a channel that pumped out three or four bits of medium content a week from writers who are friends of your organisation or admirers of your organisation, but not necessarily in your organisation? Could that turn into your own sort of mini publication with its own group of people um, following it, loving it, lapping up everything you've got to say? Yeah. Add a sub, sub stack to that mix as well. The I agree, you're right. Really Actually, good. I haven't updated this slide for a while. The sub stack is the new thing for that. But sub stack assumes that you know those people already. Yeah. I, know, I know sub stack is starting to do some distribution work as well, but me probably does the best job of yeah. actually getting in front of other people. Yeah. Um, and Substack does yet, but they will. Um, it takes time, it's not very predictable, but if you can pump out three or four articles a week, even if you can write them, even if a contributor that's a friend of your business or somebody that's a customer wants to write them, that actually is another method of you getting in front of your audience. Um, this can scale very quickly. It doesn't cost much to write content, it's relatively cheap, but a piece of content can be viewed thousands, hundreds of thousands of times in its lifetime. In some cases, if it's evergreen, it can continue to generate leads for you for a long, long time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're almost there, people. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm getting... What is it? Oh, oh geez, okay. That's nearly two hours. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, so SEO, um, so if you're looking at, you know, um, your own blog or your own website, um, this takes a long time to work as well. It does move up and down a bit, but you know, I know, I know for, example, for example, a site that's got literally thousands of posts, but it gets 30, 50,000 visitors a month from those posts. What could you do with 30 or 50,000 visitors? Mm -hmm. What could you do with 1,000 visitors? The better question to ask is, what would it take me for, to get 1,000 interested people to visit my site? What would I have to pay Google or Facebook mm -hmm. to deliver that audience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it might cost you a couple of hours to write an article, but that might provide you with ongoing business for a long time that you don't actually have to pay for. Um, PR I find quite difficult to predict. PR agencies at your stage probably not the right thing for you yet. Um, but maybe you've got a story that might be interesting that's worth spending money on PR. But you can probably pitch your story directly to businesses. You, don't, you may not even need to use a PR agency. Um, the hard thing is you have to be newsworthy. So <laughs> you actually have to have an interesting story um, or something super interesting about what you're doing, what your, client, your, what your clients are doing with your product. And understanding what's newsworthy is actually quite difficult for people to get their head around initially. They think everything they're doing is super interesting. But the reality is the rest of the world doesn't see it that way, especially journalists. Um, you might want to think about targeting the journalist directly, not group broadcasting to a whole team. So find out who covers your beat in your in that in that publication. You know, if you're trying to sell an energy solution, don't go and target the person who does cars. <laughs> don't speak to the renewables person. You know, or, you know, if you're targeting the small business, yeah. Very briefly, last year when we did our ballot box campaign in Toowoomba, yeah, we stopped the journalists of each main channel that were covering the story, um, you know, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, until we got the contact, and they wanted the story. You know, once you find who they are and you see what they're writing about, it's easy to get them. Yeah, yeah, it's not hard to find out who covers what. That's pretty easy. Most of them have it on their bios, on their bar lines, and their, and on their author page. Um, so there's all those things you can go after newspapers, magazines, websites, industry press. Magazines are actually still a thing, believe it or not. Um, some segments they work, they seem to work quite well still. Um, radio, TV, we spoke about podcasts and so on. Um, we spoke before about what can I give my client for free that's going to be really good for them, that's going to help them. 
and in some cases they can be guide books or ebooks or things that condense a topic that might take them a day to work out on their own on the web. If you can deliver them that message in 20 minutes, you've probably made a friend. You've probably made somebody want you enough to do business with you. So can you save them money by having aggregated a whole bunch of that resource into the one spot? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, webinars, we spoke about webinars, um, customer referral programs. This is fantastic if you can work out how to get customers to do this for you for nothing. Yeah. I think if you want to see somebody who's doing it really well transfer-wise, I think does a really good job of this. Um, uh, the guys from Up Banking did a really good job of this. So there's some examples of people out there with the sort of baked in the product and it's working fantastically for them. What this will do, if you get it right, is massively cut your cost of that position. Instead of you paying Facebook or Google um, 10 bucks for a lead, you might be paying zero, or you might pay a small commission to the customer. No, sorry, to the referrer. Um, search engine marketing, we don't want to talk about Google AdWords, you know it's there. It might not be there next quarter. Um, if you want to learn about how to do search engine marketing, Perry Marshall has a fairly good guidebook, plus you 50 bucks or something, um, but that's pretty useful. Um, Facebook and Twitter ads, yeah, this slide's a little bit old now. They are getting expensive. I saw a graph the other day from somebody who just spends over 10 grand a month on Facebook ads. And in the last 12 months, in the sort of last four months of 2020, the cost, the CPM mm -hmm. went from 15 bucks up to 30 bucks. Literally cost them double the amount to get the same traffic towards the later part of last year. And I've heard that from a few people. Um, as I say, you've been weaponized their algorithms. They're out to extract as much as they can out of you, and they will keep paying, and they'll keep taking that money until the last lead is unprofitable, if that makes sense. Work out how to get around them. Um, yeah, we spoke about a lot of that. And billboards. <laughs> Some people disagree with me about this, but as a small startup, mm -hmm. it probably doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of you to think about billboards, although it might make you feel really good. Um, <laughs> it's not really a great, great thing. Um, that's it. I'm done. Have a good one. Any questions? I've spoken for two hours on stop. You're also awake. That's fantastic. <laughs>